Yeah, hello. My name is Hannes, and that's David, and we will talk a bit about trustworthy, secure modular operating system engineering, which we are currently doing, or another approach to how to robustly implement security protocols. So, first of all, the, the general question of this talk is, what is the trusted computing base, and how can we get it as small as possible while still having some functionality? And the trusted computing base itself is uh, all the pieces of software and hardware of a system which are crucial for its operation. And if one fails, the whole security of the entire system is jeopardized. So, yeah, well, let's look at a, a concrete example of the trusted computing base. In this example, I will take an instant messaging client. So, as a trusted computing base of the instant messaging client, we first have the client software itself, being at some implementation in some programming language. So the client software is obviously part of the trusted computing base, because if it contains a bug, you might be able to exploit it and to uh, jeopardize its security. Then, as a next layer, we have the dependent libraries. So the client might use OpenSSL or GNU TLS or any other piece of uh, security cryptography library, or XML stream processing, or whatever. So that is obviously also part of the trusted computing base, as we've seen this year with Heartbleed, which affected OpenSSL, and which affected a lot of different applications, which all had OpenSSL as their uh, dependent library. So as a next step, we, we're not quite finished yet. As a next step, we have the graphical user interface framework, which is most often used in such a uh, client, such an uh, XMPP client. And the graphical user interface actually contains stuff which parses arbitrary binary data, like pictures and fonts, and needs to render fonts and so on. And obviously, there have been bugs in picture parser libraries like libpng, like libjpg. So this is also part of our trusted computing base. So it grows, and it grows even bigger. So then we have the programming language it is implemented in, or it provides an interface for plugins or so. And that programming language environment, that runtime, is also executed and must be part of the trusted computing base. So if there is a problem in some programming language, let's say PHP, which has a long history of uh, problems, or Java, or Ruby, or Python, or whichever you like. <clears throat> but we are, not, we are not really there yet. So we also have the big C library, which you unfortunately can't see, but you can see it here a bit. So the <clears throat> C library is also part of the trusted computing base, because it is actually there, and you execute it. It's loaded. It's loaded into memory. And the C library contains, what, around 2,000 subroutines. So if there is one exposed and vulnerable, the whole security of the whole system is exposed. And here on the right side, you also see the operating system being at uh, Linux or FreeBSC or whatever else. The kernel, which uh, provides you with the TCP IP stack and which provides you with um, hardware device drivers, that also needs to be part of, or is part of, the trust computing base. And then, last but not least, we also have the, the piece of hardware, the different pieces of hardware, your disk device, your hard drive, and so on, which all contain some firmware, which is part of the trust computing base. So it stacks up and up, and the actual question is for an attacker is, what is the weakest link? Which piece, which piece is uh, the most easy to attack here? And obviously I forgot some things, like the compiler needs to be trusted, because if the compiler is an untrusted compiler, it can just inject some arbitrary code into your executable. So what can we do? Uh, I'm here to propose how to minimize the trusted computing base, or how to get a small trusted computing base. And what, have we, what, what are the different approaches we have seen in the past? Well, the first approach, or one of the popular approaches, is compartmentalization, to just build a compartment. And that actually solves the problem if there is, an, if there is a successful attack, the impact is uh, low, 
the impact is small. So instead of running each uh, serv all services on one machine, on one operating system, you just uh, spread the services to various different operating systems. So each service runs in a, in a separate virtual machine or in a change root environment, which was one of the first uh, things developed there. Then we also have Solaris Zones, FreeBSD Jails, and Linux Containers, which is more lightweight virtualization, currently hyped through Docker. And on the other side, we have the, uh, where you actually only run the, the user space of an operating system. So you share the very same kernel, but you execute different C libraries and different uh, service uh, binaries. Then on the other side, we have the hypervisor approach, such as uh, Xen or KVM or so, where you have a small hypervisor, and on top of that hypervisor, you run all the different uh, virtual machines, which are, each of it is a complete uh, Linux or Unix uh, environment. So it is its own, its own kernel, its own device drivers, its own TCP IP stack, and so on. And hypervisors such as Xen are used around the world in this uh, cloud thingy. Uh, for example, at Amazon EC2 and Rackspace and so on. So compartments is a really nice approach to limit the impact of, attack, of an attack, but it doesn't really reduce your trusted computing base, apart from that you uh, separate the services apart. Also, the crucial question is, can an attacker escape from a change route or a jail or a hypervisor? So it's part of the trust computing base, and you actually add a bit more software. So that's the other approach, actually, which is uh, to just add stack on layers and layers and layers, because each problem in computer science can be solved by adding another layer. And the problem is your setup gets really, really complicated, gets complex. And such layers are, for example, stack protection or firewalls or intrusion detection systems. And the problem here is really that all these layers are also software, and they are part of the trusted computing base. So they need to be trusted. And there have been successful, uh, I mean, there have been vulnerabilities in firewall implementations and intrusion detection systems quite a bit. So you actually open up the attack vector if you add more layers. So, as I mentioned, piling layers, David Wheeler already said all problems can be solved in computer science by adding another layer of indirection, apart from the problem of having too many layers of indirection. So, yeah, that's the state where we are right now. So, the whole system is wrong. Let's start clean slate. Get rid of the old Akan legacy here. So, software systems are complex. Yes, today's communication interfaces are complex because we have a variety of computers. And, but fortunately, the communication is done via protocols, which are more or less uh, standardized or formalized by the IETF and so on. So the API which we actually need to implement for a clean slate approach is the API of the internet, which might be TCP IP, DHCP, DNS, HTTP, whatever. Some security, maybe TLS, uh, Zazzle for authentication, then maybe some Git, some SSH, some IMAP to communicate with the other peers, with the entire world, with the rest of the world. And then another problem in computers is persistent data storage. And I'm not talking here about a hard drive because a hard drive can fail and will fail, but I'm talking here more about a concept where to put data such that it is encrypted, stored, uh, stored somewhere, and I can actually retrieve it. And only I can retrieve it, not everybody else, because it's my data. So what are the tools for this clean slate approach? Well, we are hackers. Our tools are programming languages, and programming languages have various kinds of abstraction features. And then we have libraries, so stuff which is already there, which we can reuse. So consider that the programming language is the essential vehicle of expressing a program, and we just dissected an operating system into its parts. So if you're radical in, in 
operating system architecture, we can be radical in rethinking how to actually build an operating system anew. In terms of programming language, which, which we think is the essential component, um, during the rest of this uh, Congress, you will hear a series of talks on a string of high-profile exploits in security libraries that happened throughout this year. And the interesting property is that they're all connected by actual failures in the language, more or less. So we turn to programming language as our basic tool to, to ensure we're building a more robust, a stronger system. And the idea is actually to have programming language give us the ability to focus solely on the problem and not on the accidental complexity of solving it. So we need, we need abstraction to do that, and we want to achieve code that is small and that corresponds to the expression of the solution and doesn't contain other not really needed information. So what we do is use functional programming. And the idea is to, well, here's, a, here's an example of this functional programming. It's sending a function that increments the element by one to another function which operates over a list, and then using that function to transform a list into another one. And the idea is that with, some, with functional programming, you want to have the program that's a network of very small, isolated, local functions, which can be freely combined in, in various ways, so that you don't have to suffer from the complexity of considering which one is executed when, or which one was previous or next. Uh, this is our basis for declarative programming, which would be the kind of programming where we get to express the logic of the solution, and not all the steps it takes for the computer to arrive at the solution. This is, of course, the simplest example of functional programming we can give you, but you can't expect us to squash an entire programming paradigm on a single slide. Um, one of the, the functional programming approaches is, is, is underdefined. Many people have different interpretations of what it means. The one we use in our code actually is statically typed and quite orthodox functional programming. So we have the type system. Uh, there's been a sweat of languages relatively recently that uh, did away with types because unit tests or something. Turns out the type system is invaluable in enforcing lightweight properties. Uh, we don't have a type system such as more advanced languages, such as, for example, Idris, which can prove properties. We have a type system that can enforce them if we can see them, prove them ourselves, or at least see they hold, and then seal them away hide them through abstraction, and have the side type system propagate that, yes, now everything really holds the way we've seen in the beginning. So type system is a very crucial component to our approach. It gives us the soundness. We, we kind of, on a basic level, know we're not doing something wrong in another part of the application. And another crucial part to this functional programming thing is side effects. Now, there are definitions of side effects, but my favorite example is that the side effect is your square root function, which, when fed the number two, starts computing the square root of two, then stops, goes away, presses the far missiles button, fires the missiles, comes back, and gives you a 1.4 something something. Side effects are a spooky action at the distance, whichever means a chunk of code can, can use to influence or change the behavior of another chunk of code, which is not explicit through parameter passing and results returning. Side effects obviously create complexity and create horrible complexity, and, and while definitions of what functional programming is vary considerably with respect to whether side effects are included or not, Q, for example, the entire JavaScript, functional JavaScript movement, we subscribe to a very orthodox idea here. We don't use side effects almost ever. And it turned out, it turned out that was a, a really beneficial decision. We don't have variables in the code at all. We just call functions with different arguments. And we don't have exceptions, even though the language has both maybe very locally. And these things lead to componentization and lead to this ideal of many small functions which can be freely composed, exchanged, switched, and, and, and changed as the program evolves without considering more things that are going on. In other words, a functional language made it easier to reason about the program, and that was a crucial enabling factor. So we have seen the tools which are available for programming, which is basically the programming language. And now we propose to have this clean slate approach, where we just don't have an operating system. But instead, we have unikernels. And unikernels are specialized applications. So it's not a general purpose system here, but it's really a small, specialized virtual machine image, which even includes all the system libraries and the configuration. So a unikernel 
just directly can run on, on Xen itself. So I will explain here a bit about Mirage OS, which is the research project uh, I'm currently working in, which uh, started five years ago in Cambridge. It is all BSD, MIT licensed, all available on GitHub. It uses OCaml, which is a modular functional uh, program language. And it can compile to a Xen virtual machine image on ARM or on x86 or whatever. And the size of that virtual machine image is roughly two megabytes here in that example for an HTTP server serving also uh, sites over TLS, so HTTPS implementation. So all the crypto, all the HTTP, all the TCP IP, and all the layers up to the scheduler and whatever you, you think is inside of that image or is done by that image. So how does uh, Mirage work here? Well, as I said, we have a clean slate approach here, and we just remove all the layers we feel are rather legacy and we don't really need in a customized application. So we don't claim to build a general purpose operating system here, but a, a framework how to build your own services. And obviously my DNS server doesn't need a file system. Why should it need a file system? Why should it need users, local users? just need some sort of authentication to do updates, and the other stuff which should be done is the request response on DNS port. So Mirage on Xen, instead of having the hardware and the hypervisor, and of, on top of that, the legacy operating system, like a network stack, a file system, user process, kernel threads, some programming language runtime, some application binary, and some com configuration files lying around somewhere on some file system. We instead just have the Mirage runtime, which is an OCaml runtime, and then the application code right on top of that. So we don't have a network stack inside of the operating system and so on, but we have it inside of the Mirage runtime. Um, by using that and by directly executing it on, on a hypervisor, on a Xen hypervisor, we actually can use single address space because we don't need virtual address space. Why should we need a virtual address space if we only have one process? And we only have one process. Well, it's all event-driven, so we can handle multiple connections at the same time. But nevertheless, we don't have a process management uh, thing going on. And we don't even have a C library in here. In Mirage OS, we have no libc. So a huge bunch of code, of, of code which might contain some security issues is just removed. Let's talk a bit about modularity and what I really mean with that. So modules, modules are a programming language concept here coming from the standard ML, which then developed further to, towards OCaml. And model, modules are the composable units assembling complex systems together. So we can just stick together some modules and libraries can be parameterized by modules. And in the end, we have then an application using all those various models, modules. And a module is basically an interface. But inside of ML, there is actually the whole module system is a program language in its own, basically. So you can actually program inside of the module system. And well, what we use here, so in Mirage OS, we use the modularity from OCaml quite a lot. And that gives us that we can run the very same application code using various uh, systems or various configurations. So as a first example, uh, the old Unix socket process, down here we have the My Homepage, which is the application I'm talking about here. So My Homepage is actually that stuff I've wrote. And then someone else has written an HTTP server called CoHttp here. And I can just compile my homepage with co-http and then just run as a Unix uh, TCP IP socket process. So as a Unix binary inside of an already existing 70s Unix system. A different uh, compilation. So I don't need to change any code here. I'm just using different modules. And I can just have a Unix uh, user space uh, user space network process using a Toontop interface. So I can just use the back end in orange there, which is the C code I currently use. And then my own TCP IP stack and my own Ethernet stack, which is part of Mirage, the ETH and the Mir TCP. 
And I can just execute the, the very same application code. After recompilation, I can just execute it as a Toontop, as a process which listens on Toontop interfaces. And then, as a third alternative, I can just get rid of the Unix system and just use it, use uh, Xen instead of it. So the only thing I really need from the, uh, Xen is a virtual network interface. And I can just compile it with the, with the Xen user space or some Xen libraries, and I end up in a binary, which is this uh, virtual machine running directly on Xen. And I didn't have to touch my my application code at all. And that is great to have a modular system because I can just debug on Unix as a socket process. And then when I want to deploy, I can just one click deploy on some cloud service or on my own machine on the internet. Small intermission, this is a Kubi board, a Kubi board 2, which is a, an, an ARM 820 processor, a dual core A7. And that actually has the Xen virtualization bits. So we can actually run Xen on that board, and we run a Linaro in the DOM0. And then as the guest operating systems, we can just run uh, Mirage OS. And that is a great small board in order to, to run experiments on. What about security inside of the Xen domain? Well, inside of uh, Xen, there's uh, this uh, Cubes OS project, for example. And that Cubes OS uh, just uh, puts every device driver into a separate virtual machine, so it compartmentalizes the different, uh, the different device drivers. And each PCI ID can be um, mapped to a separate virtual machine. So this is uh, compartmentalization, and if one driver is wrong, the attacker can only uh, get access to that small compartment. Well, unless the hypervisor is... Uh, broken as well. Uh, the hypervisor is basically a, schedule, a scheduler which um, separates the virtual machines and takes care of that and schedules the virtual machines. Inside of the virtual machine, inside of Mirage OS, we just have a, shared, a piece of shared memory for accessing the packets which come in via TCP IP, we are, network, we are the net network card. And we can also do inter-virtual machine communication by sh using shared memory. That's also done, well, initially done by Cubes OS, by the VChain uh, library. So what can Mirage do? Well, we do have TCP IP, we do have some basic protocols like DHCP, HTTP, DNS, IMAP. We have a, a solution for the storage. We have Ermin, which is a persistent branchable store, which is similar to Git, but completely implemented in OCaml and composable and has various backends like in memory or on file system and so on. Then we have transport layer security, a TLS stack. And since Mirage virtual machines are so small, I mean, they are two megabytes small or so, we can just do the entire deployment via Git and via GitHub and just store the, the small blob inside of GitHub. And that is also great, because if it breaks at runtime at some point, we can just do a binary search, like in Git, what, what broke it. And inside of Git, we have this uh, small binary blob, but that is all which is needed. There's no external configuration and so on. What about performance? Well, <coughs> actually, Thomas Leonard measured the performance of Mirage OS on that uh, could be what I was uh, showing earlier. And it is uh, similar to Linux on ARM when we serve a static HTTP data. And that is uh, Linux and Mirage is running as a virtual machine on Xen on uh, QB board. The startup time, because a virtual machine is so small, the startup time is really, really fast. It's so fast that, you, that we have a DNS server which just waits for requests. And whenever a request comes in, it replies with the IP address, and then also checks whether that virtual machine is running, and if it's not running, it just starts it up. And while the, other, while the client has requested the DNS uh, query and is waiting for the answer in order to establish a TCP connection, our um, virtual machine is already booted because it boots in 20 milliseconds. So it is really services on demand. We don't run all the virtual machines at the same time, but only when they are really needed when we need that. 
So let's uh, talk a bit more about TLS. What is this transport layer security? And the reason for talking about that is, is because we developed this year a transport layer security stack for this Mirage in OCaml from scratch. And TLS is uh, the most widely used security protocol since roughly 15 years it has been uh, standardized. Um, and it is um, agile. So instead of having hard-coded uh, key exchange and cipher uh, method, it actually negotiates the protocol version, the key exchange, uh, the cipher, and the hash algorithm to use. So it is rather complex or intricate. There are also four different versions of TLS. Well, we didn't implement SSL version 2 and 3 because we felt like, well, time is over. And there's TLS 1.0, TLS 1.1, TLS 1.2. And upcoming, there's also TLS 1.3, which we haven't yet implemented. The whole issue of a secure communication is basically how to authenticate the other peer. And that is done in TLS uh, using trust anchors, so those uh, certificate authorities using X509 public key infrastructures. And yeah, I will just show you the handshake, because our stack, um, well, we wrote some <coughs> tracing. We added some tracing features. And um, within here, you, see, uh, you can see a sequence diagram of uh, TLS handshake, which was just produced by my web browser accessing that website, which is a web server I've written using our OCaml TLS stack. And you see here on the left, the client on the right, the server. I will make it a bit bigger. Um, yeah, and those uh, dash lines are uh, unencrypted messages on the wire. And those solid lines are encrypted messages you can see at the bottom here. So I will start. So first, the first <coughs> message is from the client. And the client actually says, sends a client hello. And it says, well, the version I support, the highest version I support is TLS 1.2. Then it sends some nonce, because the client needs uh, some nonce in order to establish secure communication. Then we have a set of cipher suits. So the client says, um, oh, look here. These are actually all the different key exchange and encryption methods I can use or I implement, and I'm happy to talk here. And then the client also extends, uh, sends arbitrary extensions here. Well, renegotiation extensions for security enhancements, <clears throat> then some elliptic curve stuff, and so on. So that is the first packet. And then the server actually chooses the server chooses which protocol version and which um, cipher suite to pick. And the cipher suite contains the key exchange algorithm, the encryption algorithm, and the hash algorithm. So in this case, the server says, oh yeah, let's talk TLS 1.2. Here's, by the way, my nuns here. That is the cipher suite we talk. And there is currently an ephemeral Diffie Hellman using RSA certificates and AS 265, 256 with um, uh, SHA as the HMAC algorithm. Then the server also sends over its server certificate, and that is the ASN1 encoded X509 certificate, which the client needs to check at some point. Then, since we are doing a ephemeral Diffie Hellman key exchange here, we need to negotiate or we need to pick the Diffie Hellman group and so on. So the server also sends here the Diffie Hellman group, the generator, and its public over the wire. And then the server ends with the server hello done, which is, well, now I'm done here with my key exchange. You continue. And the client, <coughs> the client um, sends over now its Diffie Hellman um, shared once it verified that the certificate is okay and the uh, server key, so the Diffie group and so on is okay. And then the master secret is computed. The master secret is uh, the 40 odd, 48 bytes of data which are used to derive the symmetric and HMAC keys. And then there's uh, the single message change cipher spec, which is first sent from the client to the server and then from the server to the client. And it says, from now on, we just negotiated on some crypto parameters and some 
key material, let's use that. So then the, uh, then the connection switches to, a, to an encrypted connection and sends over the finished package, packets. And the first finished is, uh, well, it also contains a hash in order to authenticate that the, um, that the, key, that the whole handshake, the whole binary data of the handshake was received as it was sent and there was no man in the middle who modified the data because it was all plain text. And the same is then sent from the server side to the client side. And then finally we are on the layer where we can handle out application data and application data in this case was an HTTP request which you can see here and that was sent from the client to the server and then obviously the server answers with the application data back. But let's switch back to the slides. We just saw the TLS handshake, the, the complete, a complete handshake of the TLS session, which we produced, first produced, and then sent over via JSON to the client. So the server actually um, remembered all the, all the packets which were uh, transferred and transferred them back to the client. So let's talk about OCaml TLS. That is our office early 2014 and we left Morocco, Africa. We started to develop a clean slate transport layer security stack from scratch without any funding. And it was very early in 2014. I flew there on the 5th of January this year and they would join later. And it was even before, before there were those security issues this year in various TLS implementations like go to fail and hard bleed and uh, change cipher specs uh, vulnerability in OpenSSL and various others. I mean, gnu has also had some problems. And let's uh, talk a bit about OCaml TLS. So I guess you know a TLS hipster when he says I was into it before hard blade. <laughs> um, yeah, now the, I'll try to wrap up, or actually go into details, how exactly the thing you've just seen is laid out inside, because that's the important part here. It's not just making, well, another TLS. It's like making a TLS in another way. Um, so we basically have uh, several libraries to, to handle subtests which are involved in this security protocol. So we have the crypto library, and we have the certificate library, which basically parses and, and validates certificates. And we have the overall TLS built on top of that. And, and the crucial part is that we're aiming for, for simplicity, but throughout, inside and outside. So we wanted to have the code to be simple and, and the code to be not to be prone to the spooky action at a distance, to be easy to reason about. But we also wanted the code to be simple to use. And that's actually a, a published deficiency of, of known TLS stacks. There was an actual published paper about how the unwieldiness of OpenSSL's API leads to in the wild security problems. And that's because its callback, uh, which is called back to, to check the certificates, is quite difficult to implement correctly. So we're actually aiming to do something really simple, spot on and ex as small as possible for everybody involved. And we have a, a few libraries to do that. And probably the most interesting one lying below the TLS uh, level is the crypto library. And it's also the, most, <laughs> the one most difficult to defend because, well, you should never develop your own crypto, right? We had to because it has to run in, on Mirage and it had to be mostly no camel. So we did this um, De Noalo crypto library. And, well, um, the essential trick was to try and, and not drown ourselves in the potential timing side channel attacks, other than the basic correctness, which is not horribly difficult to achieve, which is actually surprisingly simple to achieve, uh, we have to be mindful of all the other problems that a, a crypto library can be plagued with. Uh, I might expand on that later on if anybody's interested in, in one, on one talk or something, but as far as timing side channels and garbage collectors go, uh, the trick was to separate the computation and have the very cipher cores, the very crypto cores in C still to avoid uh, amplification of the timing differences through callouts to garbage collector. So that's our basic defense. What are we doing? Implementing crypto in OCaml. The timing crucial parts are not in OCaml. But most of the complex high level logic is, and that proved to be simplifying, very much simplifying. <clears throat> so yeah, we have um, 
we don't really have much crypto yet, but we have what was necessary to support uh, TLS and later an OTR that Hannes did like for kicks. Uh, so we have an RNG, which is thought to be strong. Uh, entropy sources are still debated on, but at least they've been mixed well. Uh, we have a few um, public key algorithms. Uh, we have the basic uh, block ciphers, 3DES, 3DES, and, and Rindel, AS. And basically, 3DES was for testing, so we have Rindel. And we have a bunch of hashes, which are two SHA families and, and MD5. And the separation is always the same uh, with, with, with the block of things. The block operations are in C, always, for speed and to avoid going through garbage collector. Uh, the, the public crypto is in OCaml, and it was very nice to write it in OCaml, because each single algorithm, together with all the utilities in it for it, is about 100 lines of code and very stretched wide. So it's a nice environment to code in. Yeah, and um, we also have this SN library. Now, SN is uh, this um, encoding, basically. It was developed in the early 80s by, by telecom industry and, and shows. Um, and it's, it stands for abstract syntax notation, which means that um, it, it's, it's a language to define the structure of data and then have the on-the-wire encoding of data be automatically derived from the structure. It actually prescribes the encoding once you give it the structure. And you can see a snippet of it. Um, I'm not going into detail, but it looks, it's a language in its own right. And it'd be completely relevant. It's only used for certificate and I think one other message type in the TLS handshake. So it wouldn't be interesting if it wasn't a notorious sort of attack vector in, in, in the past, because uh, the format is strict to parse. And very often, the other libraries don't really parse it safely. So now and again, uh, bad exploits appear precisely in the SN layer. So this is SN. This is the solution to SN. Uh, yeah, we have something, parser, generic commenters or something. But please do focus on two snippets on, of code. The previous one and the next one. So if you go over the sur surface index, which is slightly different, what connects those? Not a lot of thinking. And the idea is that we have uh, an embedded language, because an OCAM, the OCaml is a very nice language to embed other languages in. So instead of going and doing all the parsing that's usually been done, we just stepped aside, solved the problem of parsing in, in isolation, and then built a language like this to express what actually needs to be parsed in the crypto context. So this is one of the, one of the examples where usage of OCaml actually shines to separate concerns. Um, we also have the library that deals with certificates, which might actually be extended uh, soon to, to, to be a standalone utility for, for various things you want to do with your certificates. And the, maybe the most interesting thing to note is, is the simplicity of its API. Essentially, we have two ways to construct something that authenticates your certificates. And we implement the standard chain of trust where you provide the library with uh, a set of certificate authority routes, trusted certificates, and it can be queried with another certificate and or certificate stack and check itself, parse, validate certs and everything, and check the chain, whether your certificate authority is actually those did sign the chain, ultimately. And we also have another kind of checking built in, which is checking of fixed fingerprints, which can then be accumulated, which is the basis for trust and first use mechanism. So these are the parts. And then there is the topmost TLS, and this is a mouthful, definitely. But what it wants to say is that uh, the entire network library you've just seen in action boils down to two entry point functions, nothing more. So you have one function to, to process that data that came from the outside, another function to process data which is to be sent to the outside. And that's more or less it. Um, the type signature of the first one itself is still mouthful, but it, what it really wants to say is that it takes two things into three things. It takes whatever describes the state of the TLS session in progress and a byte vector and produces the next state after processing the byte vector, maybe a byte vector which is intended for the application to consume, and maybe a third byte vector which is the immediate response. And that's all. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't even keep state. Its state is a value. It's just a description of, of a session in progress which you can actually store and rewind back. You get out of sync with the other endpoint, but 
you can do that. And as for sending, it's also incredibly, oh, just one detail. It maps a pair into triple, but not exactly. It maps a pair into either a triple or a value that describes an error. So the error handling is completely localized in that return value and completely explicit. If you want to run it, you have to check if there was an error. And it's very easy to do. That, that kind of simplicity we're aiming at. And the other function is essentially give it a state and, and, and give it a bunch of byte vectors to process, and it will give a new state and something to send over the network. So this entire apparatus of, of doing a crypto protocol is contained in a, in a pure bit of code that doesn't even know about sockets. It doesn't know about state. It doesn't know about network. It knows about almost nothing. It just takes some values and computes some other values. And that's a really good position to be in when writing a security protocol. <laughs> and of course, you don't want to use that directly. So that's the core. And then we have some thin shims on top of that, which actually give you more or less idiomatic interfaces to work with for various uh, library setups you might use in OCaml. Uh, this, for example, one, this one example where you can accept a, a connection if you have the private material and a file descriptor, and you get a pair of channels to communicate on, and the address of the other endpoint. And relatively similar is the connect function. You give it the X509 authenticator, which you somehow synthesize the other endpoint, and it connects. This is not important. What's important is that if you have a completely pure core, not only you can reason about it, you can also glue it into whichever context you want. This is one of the gluings. We have others, and this is not even the main one, because this is not the Mirage API. We can <laughs> manufacture how ma however many of those we want, because it's incredibly flexible not to have any interaction with the outside world. So what is the status of OCaml TLS? Well, I just showed you this, the TLS handshake, and that was running on our own TLS stack on the server side. And we have that TLS demo server live since July or so this year, and we served over 50,000 sessions, and we successfully served them. So we have interoperability with a lot of different TLS stacks. Well, unfortunately, there aren't that many TLS stacks out there. And we managed to develop a working TLS stack and a robust implementation of a TLS stack in a very short time frame. I mean, it was, what, January this year when we started? So it less than... three months to working implementation. Yeah, it's roughly three months to, to do that. And while doing that, we refactored a lot of times our entire code base. And we learned a lot about how to securely write, uh, or how to write robust implementations of security protocols inside of a functional programming language, which has pattern matching, basically. And the statistics, well, I just use here C log for line counting, and I just counted the entire repository. I didn't strip out anything. And OpenSSL has roughly 350,000 lines of code. Well, fortunately, they are the LibreSSL guys who managed until uh, well, within a few months to strip out at least 50,000 lines of that code. So that is a great approach. Polar SSL, another small C-based uh, TLS implementation, is roughly 100,000 lines of code. Our code base is currently 20,000 lines of code. And we can interoperate, and we have nearly all the features we actually need to have. And also, well, the interoperability here is shown for the server side, but also the client side works with uh, various different stacks. What is the fu future? Well, we already have some uh, preliminary uh, pull requests for client authentication, AAD ciphers, and server side uh, server name identification configuration. What we currently don't have code for is session resumption and elliptic curve crypto cryptography. We might plan to do that or not. It's not that hugely important, I think. But we want to move forward. Now we have a healthy functional code base, which is rather easy to extend. And we actually extended it by developing OCaml OTR in a very short time frame. In order to do that, we needed uh, DSA support in NoCrypto. And that was done within less than a week. Our OTR. Uh, Implementation currently doesn't, have, doesn't implement the socialist millionaires problem for um, authentication. 
um, but that is uh, only a simple matter of programming now. Um, then we also have this OCaml TLS is now exposed to all um, OCaml applications who want to use it. Even we are a framework which is called Conduit, which, is, uh, which abstracts over the various kinds of connections you can have. So either shared memory or um, TCP or TLS or whatever. And the Conduit library is just both server and uh, client site in abstraction over that. And you just say, oh, I want to talk to that host. And if it's on the same uh, host, the same physical host, you can just have a virtual, uh, virtual uh, shared memory um, uh, connection. And in December, so this month, I also uh, implemented JackLine, which is a uh, command line XMPP client using our OTR library, our TLS library, and so on. So there is not much C code in this uh, Jack line because, yeah, it's only command line. And here you can see a screenshot. I don't have, at the moment, an internet connection, but I'm happy to demonstrate it to you. And what is the trusted code base in our scenario? So I started this talk with the trusted code base, and I want to also conclude what the trusted code base of Jack Line of my instant messaging client is. Well, it's a Xen hypervisor because it runs on Xen. And on top of then, we have a library called MiniOS, which uh, provides you with uh, some subs and uh, printf functionality. Then we use OpenLibM as a math library. We use uh, GNU GMP for the big number method. Then we have the OCaml runtime, so the OCaml um, the OCaml programming language runtime, which includes a garbage collector and so on. Then we have various OCaml libraries, which, which we currently use, like CSTRUG, which is a byte, byte vector, and so on, X509, ASM1, TLS, OTR, no crypto, uh, the XMPP library itself, and so on. And then, obviously, we also have the OCaml, compile, OCaml and C compiler. But we don't have any libc in here in the trusted code base, or any huge Linux kernel, because we just don't have it. So, to conclude this talk, I think functional operating systems are real now. I use it. I use uh, JackLine as my day-to-day -day XMPP client. You might ask, why OCaml? Well, because Mirage OS was there, but there are other approaches, other unikernel-based approaches in Haskell called HellVM, and there's Erlang on Xen, so you can execute directly Erlang on the machine. And I believe, fuck legacy and traditions, let's start to build secure and resilient systems. We phased out. In, in Germany, we managed to phase out the nuclear energy by 2022 or so. And that's also 70s technology. That's similar to Unix. Let's phase out Unix as well. And that, let's keep it uh, simple, and the complexity is always the enemy. And just remove the layers of abstractions, which we don't need any longer. And join, join our no lipsy movement. We also need help. Try it out. Try Mirage out. Write code. Audit the code. Break the code. Discuss the code pieces you are interested in with us. Here at the <coughs> Congress, I'm up there at the Coffee Nerds area, and I'm happy to serve you some uh, espresso while we talk about Mirage and functional programming. Let me thank uh, some people involved. There's uh, first and foremost, there's Anno Madafedi, who started this whole project back in 2009. Then I also would like to thank Peter Sewell, who's a nice guy. He will also talk. He is not here yet, but he will talk on day four uh, at the same time in the other room about why computers are so fucked and what we can do about it. And then lots of various other people and all the people I forgot. So that is our talk, and we are happy to take questions and answers. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, as said, we have about 10 minutes left for a question Q&A. Uh, so please, we have always, as always, we have six microphones in the room. Please line up behind the microphones. For people on the stream and in the internet, we also have a signal angel in the room who, who, can, who can ask your questions in the room, so please write them the question in IRC, on Twitter, wherever, and you, you, they will get asked. And the first question, please, from microphone number three. Oh. 
Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Very cool. Um, I was wondering if you um, lose most of the file system stuff and all that, which usually gives you some entropy. Where do you get the entropy from in your uh, reduce kernel? You don't really get the entropy from the file system. You get entropy from anything you can get entropy from. So you get it from inter-event timings. You get it from your CPU. Uh, you get it from your... <laughs> Actually, it is, yes, it is, Entro gathering entropy side effect, but so is using it, and I think we didn't mention it, that structurally, random number generation is a side effect that's retained. We do that side effect. Sorry, we're sorry. We lied, go home. But, but to, to, to answer that question, so inside of the Xen domain, inside of a virtual machine, inside of Xen, we actually wrote the host, so in DOM0, we still have some Unix legacy code, and that one feeds some of its entropy to the uh, virtual guests, so we wrote a device for that, for, for doing that, and for communicating the, some entropy into the virtual machine, because otherwise we are rather low on entropy. Okay, we take two questions from the internet, please. Yeah, okay, so, so the first question was asked quite some time ago, so I'm not quite sure if you've already talked to that. Um, someone asked, how do you account for bugs in the underlying layers like Xen? Uh, do you want to encapsulate those layers too? Uh, what about hardware vulnerabilities? Hardware vulnerabilities? Well, at some point we have to start, and starting from real scratch with nothing, I don't think my lifetime is enough for that. So we decided to start somewhere. And currently we trust the hardware, but hopefully more open boards and so on will develop so we can actually verify or do some sort of verification of hardware. And also the same story is true for the hypervisor. There are various projects to start to verify the correctness of hypervisors. And we're happy to switch over to write another backend for, for the new upcoming hypervisor. Okay, so the second question was that, um, as far as I understand, you don't verify your code, is that correct? And how do you test your code? <laughs> so, that is correct. I did my dissertation in formal verification of object-oriented code, where we fought a lot about shared mutable state, and that was also tedious to, to verify. And currently, we just write it down, and it uh, looks in this uh, declarative approach, it looks really readable, and you can actually read the state machine from it. And for testing, well, we have obviously interoperability tests, some unit tests, and we are also developing, we are working on a test environment for especially those uh, uh, protocols. Yeah, if I can expand a little bit on that. The next project we're supposed to do is actually a very comprehensive test suite for TLS. So it's true, we don't do verification, but it's a long story. It's not really clear what to verify at all. There is a verified TLS tag, but they verify crypto soundness of TLS, the protocol. It's not clear what to verify at all, and we don't use the system that would allow that, us to do that. But we are just about to do a very large test suite for TLS. So if you give me a specification, a formal specification of TLS, I'm happy to verify. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question for microphone number two, please. Hi, uh, so do you have plans to have DOM0 written in OCaml or as a, as a unikernel? That's the first question, so DOM0 unikernel. Second is, do you have plans for uh, targeting desktop systems, so specifically doing GUI virtualization using, well, whatever you want to use in that case. Um, and last question, what Zen distribution do you use personally to use your, as you said, you use uh, unikernels to run your Java, uh, what distribution you use? So in order, no, we don't have a DOM0 and no camel. What do you plan? Uh, not right now, because actually that's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, Niraj follows up on the tradition of so-called library operating systems, which were built in exokernels, which means that the kernel only provides for separation and isolation, but not for facilities. I think there were three of those systems. All three failed due to the difficulty of providing comprehensive driver support. The trick with Mirage is that it runs in Zen, 
And the trick with Xen is that it runs Linux, an unprivileged Linux, but with access to your PCI bus and the rest, to get drivers. So more or less, right now, no, we don't have a plan to, to build on zero in OCaml, because we would have to cover all the hardware it could possibly run on. Well, assuming we can get rid of almost all the drivers from DOM0, would that be feasible then? Excuse if me? we could have, if we could get rid of most of the drivers in DOM0, so including GPU, would it be feasible, do you think? It probably would be feas huh? feasible to implement DOM0 for so something Just the management else. domain in that case. Yeah. Yes. For something really small, we don't have a concrete plans. In principle, it would be feasible, but it would be tied to a particular piece of hardware, like a particular onboard. That's the trade-off. DOM0, a general purpose one, gives you hardware. OK, so the next question was, do you have any plans for GUI applications? So like, like desktop applications, web browser, et cetera? Um, not, not right now. So, so I'm working servers. on this XMPP client, which is all command line based. And at the moment, I'm mainly interested in that because I think that the graphical point and use, point and click interfaces, that, that is a huge amount of work to, to implement. And we are currently mainly focusing on command line and server side. Okay. So. And what Zen distribution do you use for your, for your use, personal use? Arch Linux. Well, I use FreeBSD. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, we give, we give the microphone to someone else. And microphone number one, please. Coming back to white lies and uh, state, how do you deal with timing side channels in your crypto library? Because if you re-implement uh, Cyphers, you're begging for new timing side channels. And libgmp is not designed for constant execution time of large number multiplication. And some CPUs even leak timing side channel information in their multiply instructions. So. Yeah, so libgmp was not designed for constant time, of course, because essentially saying constant time bignum operations is like saying constant time string length without the length filled. But uh, yeah. at that level, where obviously operations vary with the size, at that level we do blinding, traditional countermeasures, which are not in the constant time primitive arithmetic operations, but they're higher up algorithmic level, like RSA blinding. This same blinding is still not clear in details, but where timing leaks are present in big num code, we just blind them by the usual method. And I, I honestly didn't, didn't hear the first part of the question. We're asking about timing side channels in, in low level cipher code. Um, if I understand your slides correctly, you re-implemented most ciphers in OCaml. No, that's the trick. We actually used the reference implementation of Rindle in C. Ah. We did not re-implement it. We should switch it at some point to avoid the known cache-based index of array timing lake in Rindle. But right now we have the actual code signed by the original authors of Rindle. The trick is that the code has an unrolled rounds loop no allocation and just runs forward. So that's what's in C, everything else in OCaml. We didn't re-implement them precisely not to do nasty mistakes. Okay, thank you. Okay, a quick question from microphone number two, please. Um, I don't really understand why you think that your OS will be more secure than Linux or Windows. It, because now it's a toy OS, you have not much code, okay. But sometimes you will be feature complete and then it will be equal size in FreeBSD or Linux. And just using OCaml will not make your code secure by default. Um, so in OCaml, we have some language features which prevent certain sorts of attacks, like buffer overflows, because we don't have manual memory management inside of OCaml. So there's a whole area of bugs which we actually prevent. And the other approach is that instead of having 350,000 lines of code, we are currently at 20,000 lines of code. Yeah, because and that's it, it, <laughs> might, it might double to be at the same level of features, but then it's still a factor of 10 smaller than OpenSSL. I don't believe that. Actually. Because, because um, reviewing oh, um, code written in OCaml is much more difficult than, than say, code written in plain C. In C? Yes. Well, it is. Actually, actually, to properly answer that question, we should compare in detail the code 
for the tasks or regions that were affected by last year's high-profile exploits in other crypto libraries. And the contrast is more than stark. Something like Heartblade constitutionally cannot happen at all. Not due to GC, due to memory safety, because we can't reinterpret a key as a buffer or a vector. On the other hand, there are some logical bugs, like chain cipher suit, which is, which is one of quite, quite a bit of bugs in OpenSL this year, which is a problem in the unwillingness of encoding the state machine in C. And if you just see, look at the difference between code and how obvious these problems are in OCaml, which is how implied they are in C, I think you would believe us. If you think, okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, but we ran out of time. So please, again, ask you for a warm round of applause for Hannes and David for their talk. Thank you very much.